Good morning. <clears throat> it's an honor and a pleasure to be able to introduce Professor <clears throat> Brian Hammond. Professor Brian Hammond is an Emeritus Professor of English at the University of Nottingham and Senior Research Fellow at the University of Bristol. He has written numerous books and articles on literary history from Shakespeare to Byron. His books include Professional Imaginative Writing in England, 1670 to 1740, Hackney for Bread, published in 1997, Making the Novel, Fiction and Society in Britain, 1660 to 1789, published in 2006, Jonathan Swift, published in 1910, and he has edited Shakespeare's Lost Play for the Arden series, Double Falsehood, in 1910. And, <clears throat> if I may put it this way, his retirement has enabled him to take up playwriting. <clears throat> and his play, Ben and Jamie, uh, featuring Ben Johnson as protagonist, opens as Bern Theatre St. Andrews in April this year. So, Professor Hammond, please, if you want. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> um, uh, some some uh, years ago, I, I was listening to a lecture being given by Michael Grade, the TV executive, and he came up with some interesting statistics that I thought I might, I might uh, reprise for you. He said that in a lecture of an average 50, 50 minutes duration, after about 9 minutes and 23 seconds, some 87.4% of the audience would no longer be listening. <laughs> uh, furthermore, he said that some 78.6% of that 93.4% uh, we'd be having sexual fantasies instead. Now, it seems to me that um, I was greatly cheered by those because it struck me that even if you haven't got the remotest interest in what I have to say about Cervantes and Shakespeare, you, I will be of some use. So, um, you know, as they say, enjoy. Um, it, is a, it is a great pleasure and a privilege uh, to be giving this lecture and opening uh, the symposium. It's a, a, a little frightening insofar as I, I haven't often been at a symposium where so many people know so much more about the subject than I do, but I will, I'll do my best. Uh, uh, the title of the talk is Cervantes' Bones. Exciting archaeological discoveries have recently been made in respect of both Cervantes and Shakespeare, in time for the commemoration of the 400th anniversary of their deaths. Cervantes' bones are now known to repose amongst those recently discovered in one of the niches of the crypt below the Convento de las Monjas Trinitarias Descalzas uh, in Madrid, even if it is not yet possible to distinguish those exclusively belonging to him. Meanwhile, back in Stratford-upon-Avon, archaeologists have discovered the site of what the press release jauntily calls Shakespeare's kitchen and fridge. Uh, that's to say the, the footprint of the cooking and cold storage areas uh, in the house that he purchased as a family home in 1597. New place. Despite the promise of my title, however, uh, my paper is not a paleontological contribution. The bones I propose to speak about are metaphorical bones, those that can be discerned through the play Double Falsehood, Shakespeare's so-called lost play, premiered on the Drury Lane stage in December 1727. The play's impresario, let us call him, the Shakespeare scholar Louis Theobald, or Tybalt, claimed that this play was based on a previously unperformed drama by Shakespeare. At no point does Theobald connect the play with Cervantes, despite the fact that the plot is based on the story of Cardenio 
as told in Thomas Shelton's 1612 translation of the first part of Don Quixote. This omission is all the more curious because the mid-1720s marked a Cervantine moment, a second one, as this paper will argue, in English literary culture. In 1725, when the Motteur and Ozell translation of Don Quixote was published for the fifth time, the 1620 translation attributed to Shelton was also issued in a verbatim reprint, just as it became generally known that the painter, Charles Jarvis, had completed his new version of Quixote, which he undertook because he did not like the burlesque inflection of Motu's um, translation. It didn't sort with Jarvis's sense of the real dignity of Quixote. In 1725, Pope mentioned to Swift in a letter that Jarvis and his Don Quixote are both finished, though the two-volume translation was not actually published until 1742. But you get the sense that in 1725, there's a lot of Cervantine activity going on, and part of that uh, is uh, the, the, the double falsehood of 1727. Why did Theobald not take advantage of this Cervantine tide? Presumably because in the manuscript copies of the lost Shakespeare play that he possessed or claimed to possess, the character names were already altered and so the connection with Don Quixote was not immediately traceable. The recognition that Double Falsehood was in fact a dramatised version of the Cardenio tale took another half century to be made. In 1780, Isaac Reed made the suggestion to George Stevens. At the same time, and also by Reed and Stevens, the possibility that Shakespeare and Fletcher had written a play based on the Cardenio story was first registered in print. Now, there's no uh, need to rehearse here the question of what Theobald could have known and when he could have known it. Since the publication of the Arden edition of Double False Suit, my own edition in 2010, the debate has continued between believers and sceptics, those who think that Theobald did indeed possess manuscripts of an earlier play of Shakespearean provenance, and those who think that he did not. My sense is that the believers are ahead of the sceptics on points, but Robert Hume's recent and as yet unpublished verdict uh, is dismissive of the entire question. He writes... If I can get Shakespeare on the Ouija board and ask him to advise us on a title for our collective efforts, that's to say about the lost play and so on, I suspect he will suggest much hullabaloo about practically nothing. <laughs> well, today I want to put the case that the true importance of giving serious consideration to the double falsehood enigma and to the possibility that that play contains both Shakespearean and Cervantine DNA, is that it requires of us a reconsideration of the relationship between these two cultural giants. It seems unlikely, as the plot of the 2007 film Miguel E. William, directed by Inez Paris, has it, seems unlikely that Shakespeare and Cervantes met in Spain in the 1580s. And it also seems unlikely that they fell in love with the same woman, which is basically <laughs> the plot of that film. And even if Cervantes' distinguished biographer Luis Astrana Marin does not persuade us that Shakespeare was amongst the retinue of 506 persons brought by the Earl of Nottingham to, to Valladolid in May 1605 to ratify the Treaty of London, there is nevertheless a strong case to support the supposition that Shakespeare did meet Cervantes between the pages of the lost play Cardenio, of which the 18th century curiosity double falsehood may be almost all that survives. So, if double falsehood does indeed put flesh on Cervantine bones, what might it tell us about Cervantes as a source of artistic inspiration for Shakespeare? For many reasons, the question of Shakespeare's indebtedness to Spanish sources has not been explored as thoroughly as it might have been. One reason is that source study has not been a glamorous province within the academic empire. 
Stephen Greenblatt memorably called it the elephant's graveyard of literary history, the place where the old scholars go to die. <laughs> Spanish literature has been, I think, particularly neglected, in part because Shakespeare has not been thought to have known much Spanish. But even if he did not know Spanish, a contention currently under scrutiny by Shakespeare scholars, he knew a man who did, John Fletcher. But the relationship between Shakespeare and Fletcher has all too often been dismissed as that between master and apprentice. Fletcher has not been considered a source of renewed artistic energy for Shakespeare. Now, the Cardenio collaboration, in my opinion, prompts us to rethink all of these matters. To prepare a sympathetic hearing for the case, it's necessary to establish the Hispanophile cultural context within which Shakespeare and Fletcher were operating in the years between 1603 and 1612. Cervantes' most influential writings, Don Quixote Parts 1 and 2, and the Novelas Ejemplares, were published at a time of exceptional English interest in Spanish culture. Uh, Spain, of course, was a country reopened to diplomatic relations in 1604 uh, after a uh, uh, a long period of closure, and I am going to move to my iPad for a minute or two for the reason that I wasn't going to do this little bit, but I think it's important to get some sense of the richness of, of the connections between, between Spanish and English culture in 1604. When James VI of Scotland ascended the English throne in 1603, a speedy end to Elizabeth's Spanish wars was a strong expectation placed upon him, duly delivered by the Treaty of London of 1604, ratified in Valladolid in June 1605. The King's Men, uh, Shakespeare's acting troupe, now promoted to the status of grooms of the chamber, were in attendance on the Constable of Castile's delegation in August 1604, displaying their scarlet cloaks and doublets. Although only Phillips and Hemming are specifically named in the King's Treasurer's accounts as being paid for that attendance, Shakespeare must have been, as Samuel Schoenbaum notes, among the ten of their fellows who were also remunerated. Now, Andrew Gurr thinks that they didn't perform for the Spanish delegation. Um, they were, he says, spare parts. Mutes who displayed the king's livery as courtiers before the Spanish guests. But Catherine Duncan Jones is right to pose the question what else but theatrical entertainment could a company of players have provided during their attendance on the Spanish grandees? So Catherine Duncan Jones at least thinks that yes, you know, Shakespeare's troupe did perform for the Spanish delegation. Uh, at this time. And if so, then it's likely that what they performed was Shakespeare. If you look at the Revels accounts for the years 1604 to 5, they show the King's men being paid for the Merry Wives of Windsor, Measure for Measure, Comedy of Errors, Love's Lee Was Lost, all by Shaxbird. So there is a sense in which Shakespeare is, you know, the man and his plays are the ones that are being performed. Now, even if the Spaniards saw no Shakespeare, it's impossible that they did not exchange cultural enthusiasms. The English, learning of the achievements of Lope de Vega and Alamán, if not yet of Tirso de Molina or of Cervantes. Uh, the, the interest here, the, the sense of uh, cultural exchange is, is early registered in the, uh, and Louise Richardson, the Vice-Chancellor, referred to this in the annexation of a first edition copy of El Ingenioso Hidalgo Don Quixote de la Mancha immediately upon publication to the Bodleian Library. That acquisition was funded from a benefaction of £100 donated by Shakespeare's patron, the Earl of Southampton. In 1607, there is a first Cervantine moment in English theatrical culture. Several plays uh, refer to Quixote. Bowman's Night of the Burning Pestle, of course. George Wilkins' The Miseries of Enforced Marriage. Thomas Middleton's Your Five Gallants, where a character called Piamont says, Sfoot, I could fight with a windmill now, in Act 4. They're all published in 1607. Um, uh, uh, they all refer to Quixote. 
culturally Hispanophile connections were being ardently pursued in that year by Fletcher. Through his first collaboration with Beaumont, who was a cousin of Henry Hastings, the 5th Earl of Huntingdon, Fletcher gained the patronage of a kinship group, the Hastings and Sydney families, who had long been interested in Spanish romance and Spanish culture more broadly. Ben Jonson shows familiarity with Cervantes by 1610, references to, uh, to uh, Quixote in The Alchemist. And of course, before that, sometime around 1606 to 7, arguably the most significant homage to Cervantes in the entire history of his reception had commenced. Thomas Shelton, an Irish Roman Catholic who'd spent much of his time in exile in Spain and the Spanish Netherlands, had begun to translate the first part of Don Quixote into English. That translation, published in 1612, remains the bedrock of subsequent uh, uh, English Quixotes. Uh, Cervantes' continuation of Quixote into a second part, published in Spanish in 1615, would also be rapidly Englished. Some people think by Shelton, others think perhaps not. Perhaps the translators may have been Leonard Diggs or James Mabey, both of whom, of course, contributed commendatory verses to the Shakespeare First Folio, uh, and they were in Spain during the period 1611 to 1614. Well, now, it's difficult for me to see why, with uh, connections rucked as thick as this, uh, Cervantes has not been considered more of an inspiration for Shakespeare. If we do open our minds to that possibility, we get some interesting results. You are looking at the Albert Memorial because, uh, because I turned it on by putting my, my iPad, <laughs> but that's because uh, uh, Shakespeare is just here, uh, carefully occluded by the ornament of the gate, and uh, Cervantes is just over there. And I thought that was rather a nice juxtaposition, so I, I, I got this slide up. Uh, so, okay, so if we do open our minds to the possibility uh, that Shakespeare uh, may have been influenced by Cervantes, we get some interesting results. Julian Jiménez Heffernan of the University of Cordova has argued recently that it might be in King Lear that the earliest fruits of Shakespeare's acquaintance with Cervantes are to be gathered. He considers the structural and thematic parallels between the Cardenio story and the plot and characters of Lear and thinks them sufficiently strong to support a contention that Cardenio is a major source. Now, admittedly, if, if I have elsewhere contended it was Fletcher who brought the Cardenio story to Shakespeare's attention, then I think the likely dating of the Shakespeare-Fletcher collaboration tells against Heffernan's case uh, for the Cervantic influence on King Lear uh, on, dating, on dating evidence. But however Shakespeare came by his acquaintance with the story of Cardenio, uh, it strikes me that both he and Fletcher must also have known the story of the curious impertinent, El Curioso Impertinente, which is inset into the Cardenio story in Don Quixote. Now, in Cervantes' version of the trial of female virtue motif in, in, in the Quixote, we remember that Anselmo uh, can't rest content in his marriage to his wife Camilla until she's undergone the ultimate test of her virtue, and that is resistance to the blandishments of Anselmo's closest friend Lothario. Now, we find Fletcher and Bowman very quickly on the case with that particular story, Early in 1608, they staged a play called The Coxcomb, in which this story uh, is deployed, although it's moved very much in the direction of humorous comedy. In, in Beaumont and Fletcher's play, Antonio encourages his friend Mercury to pursue Antonio's wife because Antonio thinks that friendship is more valuable uh, than marital fidelity. Uh, this renders Antonio a willing cuckold, Coxcomb, with the accretions of cuckoldry attaching to that term, for which the Jacobeans sometimes use the word whittle. Well, the Coxcomb is already, um, uh, it's already dramatizing El Curioso Impertinente in 1608. The Coxcomb is a play that Fletcher never let Shakespeare forget. 
as is demonstrated by the influence of the character Viola on the jailer's daughter in The Two Noble Kinsmen. So for you know, several years, Fletcher was dinning into his ear, Shakespeare's that is, the coxcomb, the story of female virtue, the trial of female virtue, a very good idea for a play, William. Well, since possibly in that same year of 1608, or maybe a little later, Shakespeare incorporated the trial of virtue motif into Cymbeline, is it not odd that Cervantes is never credited with being a source of inspiration for him? Cymbeline dramatizes a version of the wager on the wife's chastity story, Le Cycle de la Gageure, the challenge cycle, that is recorded in many different versions in several European languages and recurs in diverse forms in the folktale tradition. As Valerie Wayne's thorough analysis has shown, the motif exists in aristocratic and in more bourgeois mercantile versions, the latter initiated by Boccaccio in the Decameron. But the usual source adumbrated for the chastity test in Cymbeline, if you look at the editions, uh, that's the part of the play where Posthumus boasts about Inogen's chastity, and Giacomo, having never met Inogen, offers to test that chastity for a wager. The normal source uh, is a 1560 black letter pamphlet reprint of a story first published in German as Historie von vier Kaufmännern, Nuremberg 1478 and first published in English in Antwerp in 1518. Okay, so the 1560 black letter reprint of that is called Here Beginneth a Treatise of a Merchant's Wife that afterwards went like a man and became a great lord and was called Frederick of Dienen. This version is preferred to Boccaccio because both Frederick and Cymbeline have an international dimension where the merchants who meet and wager are from different nationalities. Frederick also has the plot device whereby the merchant, Johann of Florence, with the active assistant of a servant, smuggles himself into Ambrose of Yenon's wife's bedchamber in a chest. There he appropriates jewels from her bedroom and perceives that she has, quote, upon her left arm a black wart. Now that, in Shakespeare's version perhaps more indebted to older uh, French romance, becomes the more erotic and more attractive, mole sank spotted like the crimson drops in the bottom of a cowslip. You'd rather have that than a black water. <laughs> and and he, gets, he relocates it onto the breast to, to add to the erotic possibilities. Now, of course, it's quite possible, perhaps likely, that Shakespeare's memory of this relatively obscure tale may have furnished him with plot specifics, if he knew it. But would it not be reasonable at least to suggest that Fletcher's reading of Quixote was the occasion, if not the source, for the plot strand coming to mind? Reading Quixote, Fletcher could have brought both the Cardenio and the Curious Impertinent stories to Shakespeare's attention, immediately furnishing a plot line for his own collaborative play with Beaumont, the coxcomb, and fueling a renewed interest in the topic of homoerotic friendship versus heterosexual love that runs through Shakespeare's late plays, most notably The Winter's Tale, The Two Noble Kinsmen, and I would say The Lost Cardenio. Now, admittedly, the curious impertinent story in Cervantes does not have the wager, there is no bet, but no single source has the precise admixture of elements found in Cymbeline. And as Kate Belsey remarks, a source is a source to the degree that it resembles Shakespeare's text. But it is a source, and not the work itself, to the degree that it differs from that text. In other words, we would expect some variations on, on the story. Uh, I think we can support the idea that Shakespeare was familiar with the curious and pertinent story uh, through the observation that one strand of Lothario's case against the virtue experiment deploys the image of a faithful wife as a diamond. Much of the interest in Cervantes' telling of the story lies in the outstandingly potent and articulate set of arguments deployed by Lothario to prevent the trial ever being made. He spends a lot of time saying to, to um, 
to, to his friend, look, don't do this. You know, why are you putting her virtue to the trial? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, and, and here's the way he argues it. Tell me, Anselmo, if heaven or thy fortunes had made thee lord and lawful possessor of a most precious diamond, of whose goodness and quality all the lapidaries that had viewed the same would rest satisfied. Would it be just that thou shouldst take an, a humour to set that diamond between an anvil and a hammer, and to try there by very force of blows, whether it be so hard and so fine as they say? Well, in Cymbeline, the image of the diamond functions as a sacred physical object. It is Inogen's mother's ring, given to Posthumus as a love token. And it's also a metaphor for the hardness, durability, and preciousness of her virtue. Uh, the image of the diamond recurs four times in the wager scene, uh, Act 1, Scene 5, and recurs at various other times in the text. Uh, it's also true that both Quixote and Cymbeline allude to the rape of Lucrece, though this may be too obvious an allusion in the context to be a significant link. But by 1611, the curious, impertinent story was high profile. It furnished the, the subplot for Middleton's The Lady's Tragedy, instantly recognisable because it deployed the Cervantine character names, Anselmus for the husband and Leonella for the machinating maid. In Nathan Field's play Amends for Ladies of the same period, the source is less immediately apparent because a character simply called Husband asks his oldest friend, who gets a name Subtle, to seduce a character simply called Wife. But in field, we have the diamond analogy again, and we also have the technical term lapidary, providing a, a perceptible link to Shelton's Quixote. To the unskillful owner's eyes, alike the Bristol, i.e. Bristol stone, sparkles as the diamond, but by a lapidary, the truth is found. So I see a kind of Cervantine thread going through from, um, uh, from the curious and pertinent story through Cymbeline, to plays like The Lady's Tragedy and Amends for Ladies. Uh, and therefore, I, uh, in the context of the uh, Hispanophile culture that was going on, I, I, I'm asking people to consider that the curious and pertinent story might be at least a prompt for Shakespeare's inclusion of that material uh, in the play, if not uh, uh, quite what we might call a source, depending on what kind of definition we take for the notion of source. Uh, but what is surprising to me is that in none of the in none of the editions that I, that I've come across, including John Pitcher's very splendid recent Arden Three edition, is that possibility even remotely considered. And I think that one of the effects of knowing that Shakespeare and Fletcher collaborated on Cardenio. And the renewed interest in that fact, which comes through the double falsehood, takes us back to the question and starts us thinking again about what Shakespeare may or may not have gleaned from Spanish sources. And so I'm now going to take another punt at this, which is maybe not quite as convincing, but we'll give it a go. <laughs> if Shakespeare, as well as Fletcher, knew his Quixote, then he'd also brushed up against other important examples of early 17th century Spanish storytelling. Quixote and Sancho happen upon a chain gang of prisoners headed for the royal galleys. One of them is the notorious rogue Ginés de Pasamonte, who informs Quixote that he's written his life story and further volunteers that, and I quote, it is so good that it quite puts down Lazarillo de Tormes and as many others as are written or shall be written of that kind. Now, there is clear evidence already that Shakespeare knew Lazarillo because there's an unmistakable reference to it in Much Ado About Nothing. But if you uh, get hold of Claire McEachern's Arden Three edition, you will not be asked to consider that possibility because it goes unrecorded. Um, in Quixote's encounter with Gines, I think other possibilities are manifest. Cervantes may have invented the character in his autobiography, La Vida de Gines de Pazawante, in response to the spectacular success of Alamán's Guzmán de Alvaraje, uh, 1599, reprinted in 1604. So it may be that Cervantes was having a, a, a you know, taking a, 
a passing punt at, at, at Aleman. And in reading Quixote, it's at least possible that Fletcher and Shakespeare were alerted to the stage potential of picaros, or rogue characters. Other Englishmen knew the picaresque very early in its existence as a genre. Dudley Carleton, who accompanied Lord Nottingham on the 1605 diploma diplomatic mission to Spain, had certainly encountered it. He acquired a copy of La Picara Justina of 1605 for John Chamberlain's collection. What I'm thinking about here is Autolycus in The Winter's Tale. When Autolycus bursts into The Winter's Tale in Act 4, Scene 3, it's as if he's wandered off an adjacent set where they're making a different movie. Insofar as any precise English source is suggested for Autolycus, it is the native English tradition of rogue and trickster literature. Shakespeare is certainly revisiting the work of long-dead Robert Greene in this play, using his Greene's Pandosto as a chief source. So, yes, it's likely that Greene's minor pamphlets, including the second part of Connie Catching of 1591, may also be drawn upon. That pamphlet has a version of Autolycus's sting practised on the clown and of the sheet-stealing scam. England certainly did not lack such characters or a literature in which they were represented. When Simon Foreman saw The Winter's Tale at the Globe in 1611, he remembered, and I quote, the rogue that came in all tattered like colt pixie, and how he feigned him sick and to have been robbed of all that he had, and how he cousined the poor man of all his money, and after came to the sheep shear with a peddler's pack, and there cousined them again of all their money. Beware of trusting feigned beggars or fawning fellows. Well, Colt Pixie was a mischievous sprite who compelled belief in the south and southwest of England, and feigned beggars are certainly to be found in pre Shakespearean English writing. However, it does not seem unreasonable, at least, to consider the Spanish picaresque as a possibility. J. A. Garrido Ardila, listing the main features of picaresque, rightly points to the underclass origins of the picaro, to his being a social outsider, who, having tried various professions, now lives by his wits, to his engaging in unlawful activities, and to his being a cunning trickster. There are, I think, strong similarities between Guthman and Autolycus. Mabe's translation of Guthman uh, uh, was not published, uh, certainly, until 1622, when it became the rogue. And there is no evidence that I am aware of that that ever circulated in manuscript ahead of publication. Nevertheless, pre-circulation pre was a frequent translation practice of Mabe's. And it is possible that the rogue did exist and was known sometime before it saw print. The rogue, when it did come out in 1622, was furnished with commendatory verses by Fletcher and by Ben Jonson. I think Jonson's are suggestive. Jonson says, For though Spain gave him his first air and vogue, he would be called henceforth the English rogue, but that he's too well suited in a cloth finer than was his Spanish. That's Johnson saying that Mabby's translation is better than the original. Uh, somewhat prejudiced remark from Johnson, but Johnson had a lot of prejudiced remarks. Uh, but, but I think just, just the connections again between Fletcher, Fletcher, Shakespeare, Johnson, it seems to me at least possible that um, the Gines de Pasamonte um, reference in Quixote, the way that refers on to Alaman, the way that brings back the picaresque or... or uh, you know, inaugurates a new phase of the picaresque, perhaps. All of that seems to me suggestive. Uh, the most recent ardent editor of The Winter's Tale, John Pitcher, is rightly sceptical of Autolycus's claim that he once occupied a high position under Florizel, locating instead Autolycus's confession that he was actually a footman, uh, which, as John Pitcher says, uh, was a man who ran alongside his servant's horse uh, at that period of time. Autolycus, it seems to me, keeps dramatic company with the likes of Subtle and Dull Common in Johnson's Alchemist and the rough criminal Tinker and his drab Dorothy from Beaumont and Fletcher's Coxcomb, 
underclass characters who need to change their shapes to keep afloat. Picaros, in short. In 1605, Spanish prose literature boasted two enormously influential blueprints. The satirical anti-romance represented by Don Quixote and the rogue autobiography by Guzman, both of which would go on to be translated by writers whose work Shakespeare and Fletcher knew and who were involved with them, supplying commendatory verses to the first folio and so forth. So perhaps we need a broader understanding of what a source actually is. If we take into account the artistic milieu within which Shakespeare and Fletcher were working, mightn't we be open to the possibility that both forms were influential upon them? And this openness is precisely what recent scholarship on Shakespeare's last plays has been developing. Don Quixote, of course, has never been read simply as a funny book. It's long been credited with immense cultural power. Uh, a, a, a quotation I particularly like is one dated to 1690 from Sir William Temple uh, in his essay upon ancient and modern learning. In that very seminal and important essay, Temple tells this story. An ingenious Spaniard at Brussels would needs have it that the history of Don Quixote had ruined the Spanish monarchy. For before that time, love and valour were all romance among them. Every young cavalier that entered the scene dedicated the services of his life to his honour first and then to his mistress. They lived and died in this romantic vein. After Don Quixote appeared, and with that inimitable wit and humour, turned all this romantic honour and love to ridicule, the Spaniards, he said, began to grow ashamed of both and to laugh at fighting and loving. And the consequence of this, this Spaniard would needs have passed for a great cause of the ruin of Spain. Well, in this account, later, of course, taken up by Byron in a celebrated passage in Don Juan, it was Don Quixote that faithfully undermined those values upon which the glory of the Spanish Golden Age rested and ushered in an era of decadence and decline. Now, such claims are exaggerated, doubtless. But modern scholars also consider that Quixote marks both endings and beginnings in cultural terms. Roland Green has argued that in the character of Cardenio, we can perceive a specimen of a vanished age, belonging to, and I quote, the era before changing social, economic and political conditions scientific discoveries and the lessons of overseas empire delivered a new generational outlook that many of us call the Baroque. Recent Shakespeare scholarship also understands what Cervantes offered Shakespeare in terms of temporal demarcation. As Bart Van Es has argued, the publication of Don Quixote was one crucial factor in the creation of an early modern sense of what the medieval was. Writers of Shakespeare's generation shared a consciousness of being post-medieval, partly created by Cervantes' depiction of the irrelevance of that era to modernity. As Van Es puts it, or it could be Green, his deflation of the classic medieval romance hybrid... Um, the metatextuality of Quixote, its simultaneous narrative progression and citation of the chivalric and epic romance sources which are being sent up in the developing story. You're familiar with them, Amadis di Gaula, Orlando Furioso, Belianis di Grecia, Amadis di Gaula, all of these things, uh, Palmer in Inglaterra, host of others. All of these sources are being, are being set up and sent up as the story goes on. All of this heightens an awareness of the textual nature of fiction. Books, in short, are made of other books. Well, this metatextual aspect of Cervantes' writing is also present in Shakespeare's late plays. The respects in which they include references to earlier writers and they function as a commentary on reading. That's been well analysed by Valerie Wayne and others 
And it's becoming, I think, apparent that familiarity with Cervantes is an important factor in creating the self-referential complexion uh, of Shakespeare's late drama. Van Ness's recent book, Shakespeare in Company, considers the question of Shakespeare's late style. The widely attested observation that post-1608, Shakespearean drama is very different from much that preceded it on stylistic grounds. Now, the market-leading explanation of this has been that the later plays were pitched at an indoor audience after the procurement of the Black Friars, but that's come to be regarded as only, at best, a partial account because, of course, plays presented at the Black Friars continued to be performed at the Globe. So there is no real strict separation between uh, plays intended for one audience and plays intended for another one. Neither is the political case that the king's men's greater involvement in James's court is reflected in the late play's inclusion of music, mask, and spectacle, regarded as a full explanation. Van Ness's account, very briefly, is that after 1608, Shakespeare's proximity to the acting troupe for whom he wrote roles diminished. And Shakespeare, after 1608, was actively looking elsewhere for artistic inspiration. And in particular, he was looking to the shaping influence of Fletcher. Now, this is not an account that says that Shakespeare, uh, actually, as I have put it elsewhere, Shakespeare was succession planning. He was looking around thinking, OK, I'm getting tired, fed up, want somebody else to take over. Here's a young man, Fletcher, let's start grooming him. The actual, the way Van Ness is talking about it, I think it's quite a persuasive account, is that Shakespeare was actually becoming more and more remote from the actors for whom he previously wrote roles, many of whom were dying or, or leaving the company, and he was looking actively for a, for a new shaping influence and found it in Fletcher. Van Ness underlines, and I quote, substantial passages in which Shakespeare strives for effects that another playwright, Fletcher, had made his own. And there follows an analysis of what the faithful shepherdess and philaster have that Shakespeare appears to want. And it was in the work of Cervantes that Fletcher discovered, and I quote, an individual who is trapped into understanding the world through literary convention. Ultimately, what the connection with Cervantes and Fletcher amounts to is the embrace of conscious literary artifice. Amongst the several explanations that have been given for Shakespeare's turn towards a self-consciously ironic form of romance in his late career, the discovery of Cervantes may be the single most important consideration. Prior to Shakespeare's putative encounter with Cervantes was a developing understanding of both the practice and theory of tragicomedy. Now, if as Lois Potter suggests, Shakespeare had probably worked his way through Guarini's Compendio della Poesia Tragicomica, which is an Italian text. If Shakespeare was capable of working his way through Guarini in Italian, as, as Lois Potter believes, then he would have seen theorized a type of drama that blended comedy with tragedy, and he would have begun to understand how tragic pity might operate in a Christian society. Cervantes was ripe for tragicomic treatment. Now let me explain that statement just a little further. Looking at the ending of the Cardenio story provides a clear idea of what it had to offer Shakespeare and Fletcher in generic terms. Don Fernando advises Cardenio to ponder, quote, how it was not by chance, but rather by the particular providence and disposition of the heavens that they had all met together so unexpectedly. This insistence on providential guidance and on the outbreak of weeping that accompanies the happy ending, such that it seemed that some grievous and heavy misfortune had betided them all, provides the clue that in Cervantes' treatment, the Cardenio story is in fact a romantic tragicomedy, generically speaking. Now, it seems to me that Shakespeare's appropriation of romantic tragicomedy in the late plays 
is designed to carve out a particular metaphysical space. It is for something, philosophically. And if I may put it this way, I think it is what we might term the metaphysics of the second chance. In life, we are not often given the opportunity to atone for our serious errors. Art can offer us that chance. You know how you always regret having said something to your mother or whatever. God, I wish I could relive that moment. I wish I... And you don't get in life. <laughs> but you do in Shakespeare's late tragic comedies. Through the manifestations of divine intervention or through less embodied, more mystical procedures, the audience for Shakespeare's late plays is given the comfort of knowing that human errors, however serious and potentially tragic, will not realise their worst-case scenarios. Time's inexorability, irresistible in tragedy, is resisted in a play such as The Winter's Tale through actual embodiment as a character. Faulty and weak human beings such as Leontes, Cymbeline and Posthumus, and a putative Don Fernando character in the lost play Cardenio. These characters can be given the opportunity, through being brought face to face with their crimes and expressing penitence, to redeem time. This happens through processes of generational repair in Pericles, in The Winter's Tale, in The Tempest. Uh, time is symbolically reversed in these plays. Characters seemingly dead can actually come to life. They can resurrect to enable a second chance in the most literal and at the same time most metaphysical of ways. What remains of the Shakespeare Fletcher Cardenio in my text of Double Falsehood offers only a very pale shadow of such magical regenerative mechanisms as occur in the late plays. Some people have found Double Falsehood a disappointing play, though I would maintain that as a theatrical experience it can be very lively. Disappointment, perhaps, has motivated several individuals to try to reconstruct what the original Cardenio play might have looked like. Greg Doran of the Royal Shakespeare Company and the outstanding textual editor Gary Taylor have been prominent amongst them. Between Greg Doran and Gary Taylor, the issue has been whether or not to restore Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, who are not in double falsehood, but were they in the original Cardenio is the question. The real challenge, however, for would-be reconstructors might be to indicate how Cardenio could have been more than what the double falsehood is, uh, more or less a domestic drama. How could it have matched the theatrical reflexivity and magical realism of the surviving late plays as it so manifestly fails to do in the surviving double falsehood? Well, finally, to Robert Hume and to his much hullabaloo about practically nothing... I am able to report to you today that I have succeeded in summoning Shakespeare uh, on my Ouija board, my own Ouija board, and that he has actually obliged me with a title for our collective efforts. He did not deny a rumour commenced by Luis Astrana Marin that he had met Cervantes in person. And what he suggested was the two gentlemen of Stratford and Seville. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.